Hello guys, how's it going? I hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to my YouTube channel where I go into all the details of a true crime case whilst I do my makeup. Just before we do get into the video, I feel I should give a very quick content warning that we are gonna be going into some pretty dark topics in today's video, such as murder, drugs and alcohol abuse and suicide. So if you are at all unsure about this video or feel that it might affect you in any way whatsoever, please do feel free to click off and watch something else. I'd also like to give a disclaimer that all the information I've compiled in this video has been sourced from the internet, news reports and family statements. And although I research each case as thoroughly as I can before each video, and of course it is never my intention to spread misinformation or cause offence to anybody involved, please do let me know down below if you see any false information. So with that, let's get right into the case. So this case takes place in a town called Didcot, which is near Oxford in the UK, and it took place in 2015. So it's actually one of the most recent cases that I've covered on my channel yet. So in 2015, a 21-year-old man called Jed Allen was living in Didcot with his mother Janet, Janet's partner Philip, and also his half-sister Darren. Janet had previously been married to Jed's father and together they had had three children, Jed obviously being one of them, before the two of them had separated. Janet had then met Philip Howard, who she was living with at the time of this case, and the two of them had had their daughter Darren, who was six years old at the time of this case. Now, there's a few things that you should probably know about the dynamic of this family because to pretty much everybody who knew them, it was very obvious that there were massive problems within this family. Janet, Jed's mother, had actually struggled with severe mental health issues since the age of about 11, so she was really, really young when these issues started, and as she got older, this had resulted in a intense dependence on alcohol and drugs, and at the time of this case, she was actually in treatment for a heroin addiction, so it was pretty, pretty intense drugs that she was using. Now, unsurprisingly, um, these issues which Janet suffered with had also had a bit of a knock-on effect on her son, Jed, who not only had to kind of support Janet emotionally, but also financially, which I'm sure you can imagine is quite a big strain on, you know, on a young guy. And the main thing that Jed really struggled with, as well as his own mental health issues, which he did have, was the fact that before Janet had met Philip, and obviously the two of them had had Darren, his two siblings um, from the previous relationship had actually been taken into care as a result of Janet's addictions. Now, as well as his two siblings being taken into care due to Janet's addictions, Jed had actually moved out of the house as well when he was 11 years old, after he had actually found Janet passed out from alcohol and drugs. So quite, quite a difficult thing for an 11 year old kid to handle. So during this time that Jed was moved out of his mother's house, he went to live with his father, David, who lived in Oxen, which is, you know, quite nearby to Digcot. But when he was 17 years old, Jed decided to actually move back in with his mother now that he was, you know, a bit older and a bit more independent, mainly because there were more work opportunities for him in Digcot. Now, alongside all the issues that Jed obviously had to handle as a result of his mother, he was also struggling with some pretty serious issues himself as well. One of the main things that Jed really struggled with was very low self-esteem. He really didn't have much kind of confidence in himself at all. And one of the ways that he really tried to combat this kind of late on in his teenage years was by spending a lot of time at the gym and a lot of time bodybuilding as well. I believe that when he was around his mid-teens, so maybe 15 or 16, he actually went to go and see a psychologist to help him with these mental health issues. And one of the main things that his psychologist said that he spoke about was just generally feeling different to everybody else. He really didn't feel like he fit in a lot of the time. And one of the more worrying things that the psychologist mentioned Jed had said was that he experienced these very dark thoughts about hurting people who had wronged him, which was kind of a bit of a scary foreshadowing of what was going to happen. 
As a result of these sort of therapy sessions, Jed was actually diagnosed with depression when he was in his mid to late teens, and he was prescribed a course of antidepressants as well. And I have actually no idea why this was the case, but Jed was actually discharged from all kinds of therapy or psychological analysis. I don't know whether this was, you know, just because he got better, which somehow I doubt, or he just simply got older and decided to stop going. But either way, these therapy sessions didn't continue into his late teens and early 20s. So over the next few years, after Jed had left therapy and he started getting a bit older, he actually got a job working as an Oxford University groundsman, which is a pretty good job. He was working for the council, but I get the idea that at this time, Jed's mental health issues didn't really improve. He just kind of got better at hiding them. He also said that he felt like he was constantly being treated like dirt basically at work and particularly by women and if you've watched lots of true crime videos I'm sure you will recognise this as quite a big red flag. I'm not really sure how strongly he felt this, you know, whether it was something that just kind of ate away at him a little bit or whether it was a really really big thing for him but he clearly did have a certain feeling, however big or small it was, that the world and women in particular were against him. Another thing that should be known about Jed, and again, if you've watched lots of true crime videos, another massive red flag, he seemed to have a bit of an obsession with weapons. His particular infatuation when it came to weapons, and one of the main things that he actually liked posting about on his social media as well, was knives, and particularly big hunting knives. He'd built his own collection at home of hunting knives, and he even posted this photo here on social media of him holding several sort of blades between his fingers. If you don't recognise this image, it's actually a reference to the Marvel X-Men character Wolverine, who was most famously played by Hugh Jackman in the movies, and as you can see, this character has long blades for fingers. Wolverine was actually a bit of an obsession for Jeds, he really really liked the character, he referenced him a lot, and that knowledge actually makes this case even more unnerving. So the thing that I find strangest about this case is, although we've obviously got all these massive, you know, warning signs such as the weapons obsession and his thoughts about wanting to hurt people, Jed genuinely did seem to come across to anybody kind of on the outside or anybody who knew him as a very, very normal guy. I did actually manage to find some videos that Jed had recorded on his phone of him, you know, chilling at home or hanging out with friends kind of just like, you know, Snapchat memory style videos, you know. And honestly, as much as I hate to say it with the knowledge of, you know, what happens in his future, he genuinely does just seem so incredibly normal. In most of these videos, he genuinely is just like joking around with mates. I mean, in one of them, I think he was even singing like a Queen song or something with one of his friends, it was Bohemian Rhapsody or something. He genuinely does just act like literally anybody else his age. There were a few more serious clips that I could find. I mean, there was one where he was like lying on the sofa, holding up his phone, kind of talking to his phone like that. And I think he pretty much said, this is a madhouse, I can't do this anymore. So he's basically at home talking about his situation at home. And obviously we know that he's spoken to his friends about his mum's mental health issues and all that kind of thing. So I know that that kind of sounds like somebody who is struggling with their mental health basically, but he almost says it in like a jokey way. He almost does it kind of like a, a funny voice. I mean, I don't think I'm allowed to put it in the video, but it is just honestly the most regular thing ever. He's kind of just sat there talking to his phone going, this is a madhouse, like, I can't do this anymore. Like it, it genuinely is like there's kind of a joke behind it. I don't know if that's just his way of kind of playing off his mental health and he really is struggling, but it's just weird to watch. Even Jed's friends described him as admittedly a bit of an odd bloke, but absolutely nothing to be, you know, worried or concerned about. I feel like in this video I have described Jed as a bit of a, you know, menacing character. He's obviously got this infatuation with weapons, he has these dark thoughts about wanting to hurt people, he's a big guy, he's got lots of tattoos, like he could come across as quite scary. But all his friends just said that he was 
a bit of a gentle giant. He was very selfless, he was very kind, he was always putting other people first. Not the kind of guy who they would expect to go on and do what he did. So just as I've said, nobody could really predict what Jed was to go on and do on the 23rd of May 2015. There were absolutely no red flags, no worrying things that he'd said leading up to it whatsoever. So as I said, at this point, Jed was living at home with Janet and Darren. So we already know that Janet was obviously still struggling with her mental health issues and obviously her drug and alcohol addictions. And actually her partner, Philip, who she'd been with for about 10 years at this point, they'd been together for quite a while, had also started recently using heroin as well. And as a result of this, Janet had ended up kicking him out of her house on Vicarage Lane, which was a house that they'd moved into a couple of months before this crime took place. So on this particular day, the 23rd of May 2015, Philip, who was still obviously living separately from the family, had actually come round to visit because obviously, you know, he was still Darren's father, he still wanted to see her, so he would just occasionally come round to the house to come and visit and on this day, he was around the house. While Philip was over, Jed had actually gone out. He'd gone out earlier in the day with a few of his friends and they had all gone to the Royal Oak pub, which was about a mile away from the home. Jed actually wasn't a massive drinker. He didn't tend to drink all that much when he went out with friends. And on this particular evening, the bar staff said that he had a couple of lagers. He wouldn't have been drunk, nothing like that. And according to them, he acted very much his usual self and just absolutely nothing was amiss. So it's not actually known what really happened in the time between Jed leaving the pub that afternoon and what happened that evening. It's honestly so hard to imagine what caused such a drastic change in his behaviour when just a few hours earlier he'd been just sat at the pub on a regular afternoon having a few drinks with his friends. It's assumed that there was some kind of an argument, possibly between Jed and his mother, but the reality is that just nobody really knows what went wrong. Further than the grisly crime scene that the police discovered that evening, really very, very little is known of what happened between Jed leaving the pub that afternoon and him being seen on CCTV footage at around 5.30 p.m. boarding a train to Oxford. So Jed had clearly left his house after committing the crime, which we will go into the details of later, and boarded a train to Oxford. So once Jed arrived in Oxford, he went to a WH Smith's, which if you're not from the UK, it's basically a shop that sells all sorts of stuff, mainly things like books and food. Um, I don't know what he bought here. He was just seen on CCTV. And then once he left there at about 6, 10 p.m., he removed a hundred pounds from an ATM. Soon after this, at about 7 p.m., Jed sent a text to one of his friend's group chats saying, I haven't got much time, they know. I am nothing more than worthless. I've done what I had to do. Please don't cry for me. I love you very much. I am in peace now. So I'm just gonna give one more trigger warning here as I'm guessing you can assume what Jeb was about to do. The last thing that's really known of Jed on this day is that he called a friend, don't really know what was said on this phone call, but he called a friend as he walked to a patch of woods in Oxford before sending one final text to his friends and his dad before taking his own life. Now, unsurprisingly, Jed's friends who had all received this last message were getting very worried about Jed. They didn't know if he was safe. They didn't know what he was going to do. And so one of them decided to actually go to Jed's house on Vicarage Lane to see if he was okay. And I cannot even begin to imagine the scene that he was greeted with. At 8.20 p.m., the friend arrived at the house on Vicarage Lane, went inside and discovered Philip's body on the floor of the living room downstairs, with Jed's hunting knife still embedded in his body. The friend obviously immediately called the police, and when they arrived, they also discovered the bodies of Janet and Darren murdered upstairs. There was blood all over the house. The three of them had very clearly put up a good fight against Jed, but obviously, as we know, Jed was a big guy. He had a lot of experience with knives and handling knives. 
and there was just no way that they were gonna overpower him. It really didn't take long at all for the police to pin down Jed as the main suspect for obvious reasons such as the worrying text that he had sent to his friends, the fact that he just simply wasn't at the house, and also the fact that the friend who had found Philip's body was actually able to identify the knife as Jed's. Alongside that, there was also a shoe print that had been left near the door, which was from a very large size of shoe, the same size shoe that Jed wore. And as well as that, there was also a blood splattered notebook, which had been left on the kitchen table, which said, I know the truth. I don't want it for my family. This is the end. And it was scrawled in blood. The final discovery that the police made was that on one of the upstairs bedroom walls, Jed had actually written in blood, I'm sorry. It is literally like something out of a horror movie. It is absolutely unimaginable. So the first thing that the police knew they needed to do was hunt down Jed. And given the nature of the message that he sent his friends, they assumed that they needed to do it fast. A team of over 100 officers began a search for Jed and they mainly used the CCTV footage from Didcot Station to assume that he had made it to Oxford. The first place that they thought to look for Jed was in the Oxford University grounds where, if you remember, Jed used to work but they didn't find any trace of him. The search went on all through the night and well into the next day as well, and at 1 p.m. on that day, the 24th of May, the police decided to release photos of Jed in the hopes that somebody from the public could come forward and identify him. One of the main things that they told the public to look out for in their search for Jed was Jed's very unique tattoos. He had a tattoo of a spider on one hand and a scorpion on the other. Still no sign was seen of Jed, however, until 36 hours after the killings, when a dog walker discovered his body hanging in a tree in a patch of woods near Marston Ferry Road at around 5 p.m. on that Monday, and she actually recognised him from the news. A post-mortem found that he had no drink, drugs, or steroids in his system. He had been completely unintoxicated, and honestly, at this point, all fingers just kind of pointed to him as responsible. So obviously given that this was kind of just an open closed case, they knew who was responsible and they knew that there was no way he could ever do this again. There was no trial and all that was really left to do was just try to help the family and friends of the victims to cope with their loss as best as they could. This was honestly quite a harrowing case to cover. Just the fact that one of the victims, Derin, was just so young and the fact that it was her brother, like in her last moments, she would have seen her brother who she knew cared about her so much and had spent all that time with her and had picked her up from school doing that. It's, it's just unimaginable. I really wish that I could know what it was that caused Jed to do this, whether it was mental health issues, whether it was something else. There's just so many unanswered questions in this case and I just wish that we had more information on it to help it never happen again. But anyway, that is all I have for you on this case. I really, really hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, then make sure to let me know what you thought down below. Let me know if there are any cases that you want me to cover next. And as always, don't forget to subscribe and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.